Hi. Um, so we're very excited to have um, Paul here to talk to us today. Um, as Anna said, this is the first distinguished lecture um, since sort of the pandemic shut everything down. Um, so it's, it's appropriate that the topic is um, about what we've learned about economics and the macro economy in particular um, over this um, period. Um, and I guess um, rather than you know, read his CV, I thought I'd try to answer the question is, you know, who is Paul Beaudry? And why is he qualified to give this particular lecture uh, at this particular time? All right. Now, first off, he ticks off one of the boxes, um, which is that he's one of the most preeminent um, academic macroeconomists uh, in Canada. Um, he has a huge body of influential work. He's pu published dozens of papers in all the it journals. Um, but he's not just an academic, because he's coming here today to talk to us um, as Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada. So he has his feet a little bit in the academic distance camp where we're kind of studying things from afar, but he's also been at the bank during the pandemic, you know, getting his hands dirty, um, worrying about questions about, you know, what to do. Um, but in addition to that, he has his, his feet in a number of other camps. Um, so Paul, turned, uh, when he started working, worked to some extent as, as a theorist, you know, very abstract models, contract theory, that kind of stuff. You know, the sort of things that our, that our students get to see in, in their theory um, core. But he's also very much an empiricist, and he's done a lot of very empirical research, a lot of measurement type of stuff as well. And so he's, he's unique in that sense in, in that a lot of academic economists tend to specialize, and they tend to do either more theoretical work or uh, more data work. And, and the personality and mindset to do both of those things well um, is quite unusual, and, and Paul um, fits into both of those camps. Um, second, or third, um, he's a macroeconomist, obviously, um, so he has sort of a big picture view of how the whole economy works, um, but he also, you know, gets down into the weeds. Um, he's been working recently on some of the, well, uh, the minutia of how payments clear in real time and the details, the technical details of how you get a check to clear um, instantly so that you don't have to worry about payment crisis. And finally, um, if you look at, if you do look at his CD, uh, CV, you'll see that he's just worked on uh, a, an enormous array of different macroeconomic topics. Right. Obviously, he's worked on business cycle problems and monetary and monetary policy. Um, and there, he's most known for some of his work on new shocks, this idea that you know, people's, what people are expecting or learning about what's going to happen in the future can be a source of business cycle fluctuations today. Um, he's also well known as a labor economist, um, where he's worked a lot on um, the effects of skill bias, technological change, the demand for skill, and the impact that has on the wage distribution. But in addition, he's worked on the Great Depression, measures of productivity growth, the global income distribution, contract theory, search theory. It's just worked on a ton of stuff, right? And if you're going to tell us, you know, what did we learn about the economy during COVID, you kind of have to know a lot about what we thought beforehand. And Paul's in a great position um, to, tell us, uh, uh, to, to take that point of view. All right, so you have Paul here, who's an academic and a policymaker, a theorist and an empiricist. He has a big picture view and is not afraid of the details. And he's worked on a, a ton of different topics. Um, so he's a perfect speaker to tell us what we learned about the economy and how it works during COVID. And since you all came here to listen to him and not me, I'm gonna get out of the way now and let him start. Well, thank you very much, Matt. That was a very nice uh, introduction and I, hard to kind of uh, match those expectations. But I want to say hello to everyone and uh, thank you for being here. It's really a nice and really a pleasure to be able to give this lecture. There's been uh, really great speakers in the past. And I'll hope to kind of at least try to match some of that, that standard. Also want to thank Francisco that was the first person that kind of, uh, kind of thought about inviting me to, to this talk. And I bring this up, and this is also Matt, and we've been kind of discussing things over, over the years, and we've talked a lot about kind of problems of coordination, spillovers, or things you might have heard in some of the courses you might have taken from them. And these are things that I'll be talking about today, so I hope that 
uh, re resonates with you as we kind of discuss some of, those, some of those issues. I'm also particularly happy to be here in person. So since COVID, this is actually my first speech that's actually in person as I'm giving this. All the ones I've been giving since uh, COVID were all online or from the Bank of Canada and kind of uh, filmed from there. And so this is a real difference and it's real, a real pleasure. And I'm sure you're, you'll, you're feeling it too. I mean, this has been a really tough time on a lot of people. And especially university students and things where, you know, university is a place where you kind of come not only for classes, but for interaction, for meeting people. And this has been hard. You know, a lot of you have had to kind of stay and had classes at distance, not kind of uh, taking advantage and all benefiting. And that's been hard on top of the health parts. So it's been a hard period. Now we're kind of going through, and there's a lot of difficult parts also on the economy side. You know, we, we went through the COVID, the certain closures and different things. Now we're kind of, we're living through a lot of supply bottleneck issues. We have the war in Ukraine. We have inflation. So that's all issues that we kind of have to address. And the question is how to address them. So when all these type of uh, the COVID started at the Bank of Canada, we had to kind of think a bit out of the box. You know, when there was these closures at the beginning is how do you uh, manage a crisis like this? What do you do? And you know, we had to think about it. And again, uh, when Matt was bringing up, you kind of think about data and you think about theory and you try to try to apply things, but these things are different. And you say, well, to what extent can we apply things to help us understand what's happening? Now, in the talk today, I'm going to try to take a little bit of that hindsight. One of the things we use a lot to try to figure out is to look back in the past and look at experiences that are maybe similar a bit and try to figure out to what extent can we learn and apply them to the current situation. So I'll be discussing some of these, some of these aspects as we go through of looking back and saying, okay, from the past there was something that was similar, did that apply or not, and what did we learn? And that's what I was kind of thinking when I have the title here. What are we learning in this macroeconomics of the 2020s? What did we kind of see are different? What are the kind of forces? What are the type of issues that kind of brought up? So with that in mind, I'm going to try to address three topics today in my talk. So in the first part, I want to talk a bit about the international uh, dimension of some of the COVID parts. And in particular, thinking about policy. So again, I'm coming from the Bank of Canada and thinking in that policy uh, realm. And when policies are done at different countries, they're done in this kind of independent way, and, but they influence one country and another. And you kind of start wondering to what extent that has influence, what way should we think about those influence, and whether there'd be more gain or not to coordinating actions, and to what extent that was done properly uh, through this type of, the cri type of crisis. The second issue I want to discuss is related to the labor market. And here, in terms of the labor market, I want to think in particular, this was a rebound out of a very deep recession, kind of bouncing back and getting back to uh, low levels of unemployment quite quickly. And that was quite different than a lot of the more recent uh, episodes of recessions. I want to kind of look into that, what was different, what played a big role. In particular, I'll kind of emphasize aspects of balance sheets. And I'll kind of explain what I want to mean there in terms of uh, thinking about the labor market. Finally, I want to get to uh, the core aspect of what the Bank of Canada is about. It's about controlling inflation. That's our mandate. We want to have inflation down at 2%. That's where it was for a long time. Now it's running way above. We had new data today. Okay? Inflation was uh, over the past year has been at 7%. That's a slight decline relative to the previous month. So there's kind of a good part news there. There's aspects. But we still have very high inflation, much higher than what we'd want. And it's actually quite broad based. A lot of the decline that we just saw over this very recent period was due to uh, falling gas prices. That's one element in that inflation. But to get, bring things back, we really need a much more uh, coordinated part. And one of the aspects I'm going to discuss is the role of inflation expectations in that whole process and how we can think about them, what are kind of the different theories of those expectations, and how it manage, matters in terms of the communication of monetary policy. So those are kind of the, the subjects I want to cover today, all three of them. So starting on the, uh, on the international front, okay, the first thing I want to kind of just remind people is a little bit of how you know, integrated we are in the world here. Okay? And so we have the different panels over here. I'll kind of try to point at different things. So these are growth rates for a set of kind of like we have Canada, the US, the Euro area, Japan, UK. So you think about advanced economies and look at the growth rates, kind of how similar they are across. This is the COVID period. 
we really had this very kind of quick contraction of the economy, and then it's been kind of, this is all the contraction area, and then eventually it really popped back up and come back down here. And all these countries are kind of growing at the same type of, of rate here. Now, one of the periods I'll bring back is uh, kind of in comparison, when you look at these negative periods, this is a kind of a recession. If we look back over here, these are these negative periods over here. This is the 2008-2009 period. For a lot of you, you were kind of you know, too young to kind of remember it directly, but maybe you've kind of discussed it in some of your classes and different things, and that was reflecting that period of, um, that started in the US, a housing crisis that became basically a financial crisis around the world. So the qu question is, to what extent did we learn things there, which was a different type of period, can, to what extent does it help us understand some of the things over here? So I'll try to compare those type of aspects. Now, over here we have inflation. Now, you see again, there's kind of these movements in inflation, but it was quite stable for a long time at around that kind of 2% type of level. Again, across most of these countries, there's a bit the exception, Japan is on the slow side. It was closer to 0% in Japan, but mostly the other countries were around that 2%. But what's the really kind of striking part here is this big increase at the end. That's what we're living through right now, is this big increase in inflation that is shared among a whole set of countries. So there's really common elements in that, in that whole process here. What's important to see is, if we go back to this great financial crisis here, where you can see the recession here, you don't see the inflation part coming out over in this part. So it was a part that had some similarities, but some things that were very, uh, very different there. So we want to understand that. Now, when we think about that, so when we're thinking about you know, these different countries, and think about Canada as a, kind of how it compares to the world. Well, we're rather small relative to the world. If we think about total production by Canada relative to the world production, we're about 1.5%. So it's a rather small part. And in many ways, most countries are a little bit like the same thing. Most countries are small relative to the overall world. There's a few exceptions of being big countries relative to the world, but most countries are small. So when you're deciding policy, okay, all countries are basically, obviously they kind of take their policies and deciding what's good for their country, but they often take as given what's happening in the global world. So if you've kind of done any game theory, that's kind of the idea that you're playing Nash in some sense. You're kind of taking what's happening in the world as given and deciding what's good uh, good for you. And we can kind of think, well, even though you're small, if everyone's doing the same thing, it might add up to something kind of uh, rather big at the same time. So we have to understand what are those type of spillovers that are coming in when everyone's doing uh, the same type of things in the economy. Now, when we think of spillovers, so again, I'm trying to think about different policies, whether it be fiscal or monetary policies in different countries, that obviously uh, in the, uh, when you get a recession like that, you want to stimulate and bring back the economy into into production, so you usually put stimulative policies, you can start thinking, what do those, those policies, what are the spillovers on other countries? What is the aspect of the international part of how much there is overall stimulus in the economy, how that affects uh, other countries? And you're, there's really two dimensions we can think about that. There's an activity dimension and there's kind of a price and inflation dimension. Okay, when we think, what do I mean by the activity dimension? If another country or the world is kind of stimulating, what does it do to Canada? Well, usually that kind of increases our exports. If they're doing things, they're going to demand some of our goods. That is increasing our exports and favors uh, more of a recovery. And we usually think of that as a good thing. That's the stimulus el elsewhere in terms of the activity. At a recovery stage, we usually think that's a good aspect. On the inflation part, it's a different part. If the world is all kind of stimulating everywhere, it might be putting up pressure on certain of uh, the international traded goods. Okay? If we're importing those, that makes inflation in our country as we're importing all those type of in, uh, internationally traded goods. And that's the spillover that is in terms of inflation. We usually think of that as a negative aspect of how other, uh, other countries' stimulus is affecting us. So the question of what other people are doing, how good it is for us, depends a little bit on those two forces. Now, coming back to thinking about the previous uh, crisis, going back to that 2008-2009 period, so the, the uh, global financial crisis, this was a period where, uh, especially in the U.S., there, was this, uh, there had been a lot of speculation on housing. The market for housing kind of collapsed. This affected the financial system. The financial system started to have problems, and it kind of spread out across the world. So we went into a, an important recession across the world, and then 
the idea of what was dominating then, there was kind of like a lot of capacity. The economy, like no one was consuming, no one was kind of doing anything, and the economy was not picking up very much. So it was really viewed there that stimulus that was kind of done in other countries were usually acting mainly through this activity channel. So it was actually a good thing. More people, other people stimulated, more we kind of saw it was a good thing for ourselves. And with hindsight, when people look back at that period, it's generally thought maybe some of that stimulus added at the international level, as everyone's pulling back and doing what was good for their own country, might have pulled things back a bit too quickly. So that kind of colored some of our thinking as we went into this type of crisis. And here, again, things went down. And you know, there was a, a lot of uh, stimulus. But the way this crisis was was very different than the uh, great financial crisis. Obviously, there was a, you know, a closure of a whole set of sectors. We wanted to get activity back on, get consumption back going. There was a lot of sectors. There was lots of unemployment after that first period of closures and reopening. You wanted to get things back. But still, there was a lot of parts where we were kind of locked down. We couldn't go to restaurants. We couldn't go to the theater. We couldn't go to all sorts of places. So what was happening is even though there was a lot of excess capacity in the economy, we tended to be all kind of shifting our expenditures only into goods. Okay? So a lot of people were ordering things. You, know, you order online, you kind of get things because you're at home. You can't go out and spend anywhere else. So everything was going into goods. So in certain sectors, we came, it became very tight, and especially in kind of good producing sectors. And that's what we saw. We started seeing bottlenecks across, across the world. And so instead of thinking of the spillovers from other countries to us as being this positive, all of a sudden there was more this aspect of the spillovers were kind of coming through this inflation front, which was much more negative. So more others were kind of uh, stimulating their economy. Instead of kind of helping our exports, it was often just increasing the price. And so if I take the example, think in the car uh, sector. So when, the, for example, the US was stimulating, Usually, you know, that kind of creates, you know, more demand for cars. And in Canada, especially in Ontario, we produce a lot of car parts. And usually that's good. Okay, so we get more exports. That would help the rebound in Canada. But what happened instead, we had these, there was so much demand on certain things, especially in terms of chips. And there was kind of these bottlenecks in Taiwan, and there wasn't enough chip production, so you couldn't produce cars anymore. So you're having demand on cars, and all that was happening is we weren't getting this activity channel, we were getting only the inflation channel, and that was the kind of externality was much more dominating through the aspect of this inflation channel. So there's much more of a negative externality there. And then if you want to coordinate on the negative externality, you'd kind of want to say, if all the countries at the international level maybe have kind of slowed down a bit there uh, or taken out some of their stimulus a bit sooner, maybe for the world as, as a whole we could have been better off. So it was a very different type of aspect. Noticing what kind of spillovers, is it better to have other countries stimulating or not, what is important. And I bring this up, so you know, I sit at, uh, go to a lot of these international meetings, and it's at these international meetings we try to coordinate these these type of decisions and try to at least influence things and trying to understand how this crisis was different was an important part. And at the beginning, we really thought very much through the activity channel and eventually we had to really think through this inflation channel, which changes very much the spillovers. Now we're in a new phase where everyone's kind of uh, tightening monetary policy at the same time to kind of reduce these inflation forces and we have to also understand those spillovers. So one of the things we learned here was really the nature of spillovers can really change between these crises. You can't just take one rule from one of the crises and apply it to another one. You really have to understand it and uh, try to think in those, uh, that type of international uh, coordination type aspect. But with all that said, it's very hard to, to push international coordination because each country by itself is doing what's best for them. So again here, this is the question is, could the whole world have done something better, but each country was trying to do what was kind of good for them and not taking all those, uh, those things into account. So that's a bit the idea of those international spillovers. What we learn, they can change, they can be different, and now that we're in a new phase, we have to kind of understand that and kind of move forward and uh, think about that. The second issue I want to address here is this aspect of the labor market. Okay? And in particular, compare a little bit of how the recovery in the labor market was here relative to uh, previous recessions. Okay? And in particular, what I want to emphasize is how quick this recovery was and how extensive it was, and then try to ask what was different and what did we learn and what, how did that work. Okay? So what do I have on this figure? So this kind of normalizes employment uh, at 100 back at the beginning of the COVID crisis. 
The red line is in Canada is the employment levels. And you see the employment levels here in Canada kind of going down by almost, you know, not, not quite 20%, but almost 20% that we've kind of closed down here. This was the early period where things really closed down. Then we had a rapid reopening. And then, so that's not too surprising. You close it down and you had the rapid reopening. There's a lot of things just mechanically you kind of got things back. But I want to emphasize all this since that rapid re how that picked up, how we see this employment part kind of grow here. And that's very different than, so we surpassed our original level quite early on and kind of kept on. So here we, are, we have been at a place where employment's been higher in Canada than it was pre-pandemic level. So we've actually increased that employment, passed that uh, a long time ago and kind of went above. A lot of these other cases took a long time before it kind of came back or kind of slowly made it. So this was a particularly strong rebound in the labor market. I want to kind of think about what kind of caused that and how to think about it. Here I'm showing in the US the similar type of thing. So you had this closure. They kind of came back. They've actually kind of came back closer to where they were originally. Now they're a little bit kind of coming above. But still, they had this very kind of quick rebound too. Even if we take away this first down and up, we have all this kind of long part kind of going up. And so that was very quick. And I want to compare in particular. So all these other lines are other, other recessions. I want to compare particular relative to that purple line. So what's on that purple line? That's the path that happened after that great financial crisis. Now obviously, as I said, the great financial crisis was a big, much bigger crisis in the US than it was in Canada. But we can see what we learned through that part. And if you notice there, you don't even see it picking up yet. It takes a long time. It, you know, my, my figure here isn't long enough to show when it kind of caught back up, which meant that basically we call that like this jobless recovery. You kind of came out of that crisis and there was hardly any of these creations. There was a lack of creation of jobs. We're below employment as the prior to the crisis for a long time afterwards. The system was having trouble kind of catching back up. Now, what was driving that type of part? Now again, going back to that period, okay, we had a lot of people, especially in the US, that had what we call weak balance sheets coming out of, the, out of that crisis. What do we mean by weak balance sheets? So you can kind of think you might have assets, especially, or uh, you know, and liabilities. Might, right now, you might have more liabilities than you have assets. You know, you're kind of students and kind of picking up. But what happens is you know, if people kind of come into a crisis and have a kind of uh, healthy balance sheet that have certain assets and certain liabilities, and then their assets fall a lot in value, and that's what happened in the US. A lot of people lost a lot of wealth through that. So then when they're kind of coming back, they're trying to rebuild their, their balance sheet. So what are they doing when they're trying to rebuild? Well, they try not to consume, to try to rebuild and save and kind of get, get things going there. Well, that, what happens through that type of process? Well, let me just... Well, this is what we call the standard paradox of thrift. Okay? Everyone would like to improve their balance sheet by saving, but if everyone saves, what happens to the economy? Well, if everyone saves, you start having, you know, you kind of aren't consuming, so you know, jobs aren't being kind of created, or actually demand stays that very low. If it lows, you kind of don't get jobs. You kind of don't have jobs. You're not improving your balance sheet, and the system kind of stays there for a while. Okay? And that's a kind of paradox where everyone's trying to improve their balance sheet, but if everyone tries to do it together, you're not getting that kind of improvement. Again, that's the kind of sense of that kind of spillover at the, at the national internal to the economy of how it's functioning. There's another very related type of aspect of that paradox. It's also when, when unemployment is very high, you know, you're always scared if even if you have a job, you might want to save a lot just in case you lose the job because you think it's very high. So you're trying to protect yourself against unemployment. Well, we have that kind of same paradox of protection against unemployment. If everyone tries to protect themselves against unemployment by saving more, well, you get, you're not getting the recovery in demand you want. If you're not getting the recovery in demand you want, that doesn't make you know, more jobs, and so you're not reducing unemployment, and the system gets stuck there. And that's the aspect here of that type of uh, interaction in the economy uh, that's, that was important in that, um, in that period, and in most of our uh, recessions. Well, the good thing is, we learned quite a bit from, let me wait a second. Uh, we learned quite a bit from that period, and in particular, we learned that we have to watch out. If you want to have a quick recovery, try to protect people's balance sheets so they're not trying to kind of do this when they come out of the, out, out of the recession. So one of the things that happened through this was 
you know, in general, both on the fiscal side and on the monetary side, tried to stimulate and tried to help the system such that we don't have this kind of balance sheet recession where everyone is in a big difficulty and therefore trying to build back their balance sheet and trying to uh, bring things because then you won't get the recovery. And a lot of the programs we brought in, and again here, what we saw, we learned from that previous period. We didn't want to have things that were that, that slow coming back in, so we wanted to help things. In particular, if we look here, we have, again, here on the left-hand side, you can see across all these countries, these are kind of uh, government spendings uh, relative to uh, GDP. And you see all this extra spending that was happening almost all across these countries. Again, Canada being in red here, a big jump in government spendings and then a decline, which was exactly meant to try to encourage people to kind of keep on consuming, even if it looked very uncertain. There was lots of unemployment and kind of getting, um, getting the economy back. We at the Bank of Canada also, so this is our balance sheet, so we have assets on our balance sheets and liabilities on our balance sheets, and we expanded our balance sheets. We tried to help the financial system, making it uh, more liquid, making it easier for people to transact and get the, the system. We also tried to reduce interest rates, both at the short end and the long end, try to create this to try to favor kind of keeping people consuming during this period and supporting. And it's actually, like I said, it's worked uh, quite well there. Now, again, there's no free lunch here. Now we have to kind of get these uh, public balance sheets to kind of come back down, both to bring back down inflation to reduce some of that uh, demand in the system and also make room for uh, the possibility of wanting to use them going, in the, uh, going forward. Now, I do want to say that this kind of process of getting a fast rebound was partly kind of this was a desire trying to get that that part and kind of expanding that way. And I think for certain aspects it's been especially successful. So one of the things we were very worried about when we were at the initial part in this crisis was a lot of scarring or kind of things that kind of last a long time, especially on students. Okay? And we know there's been a lot of difficulties with certain parts of, the, uh, of learning and different aspects like that. But in terms of the labor market, if we look at these past recessions, one of the type of scarrings we often had in the past was this notion that if you were a generation that kind of went to university and coming out at the end of a recession, it usually took you many years to catch up to previous cohorts. You'd go out into a labor market that was weak. You wouldn't find kind of good jobs. You wouldn't find jobs that match your things. It takes years to kind of catch back up. One of the things, at least now, kind of uh, that type of scarring, we're seeing a lot less of it. There's been a lot of that possibility of employment and a lot of opportunities. There's lots of vacant jobs out there. Firms are willing to kind of hire people, actually train them more than they wanted in the past because there's this aspect. So at least, I know it's been very difficult for a lot of you, but at least if you're graduating this year or things, at least the labor market in general is in a good situation, and that's something we were worried about. Now at the same time, all that, that kind of growth and those good aspects of it is kind of part of the aspect that also relates to inflation, and that brings me to my uh, last subject here, th th talking about inflation and in particular, inflation expectations. Okay. As I said earlier, we had at, this, uh, at the, the beginning, right now, inflation's running at around 7%. Our goal at the Bank of Canada is to have inflation at 2%. That's our mandate. That's the mandate we get given um, to kind of look, and that's what we're committed to. Now, if we look in the past, we've been in that type of regime of kind of what we call inflation targeting regime. A, a well-defined mandate in terms of inflation for a central bank. We've been in that kind of regime for a bit over 30 years. And in most of those, that time, we've managed that aspect of having inflation at around 2%. And what happens when inflation's around 2% and everything kind of goes is what we like to be at the Bank of Canada, everyone forgets about us. We do our job well. People don't have to talk about the Bank of Canada. They go around their business. They do all their decisions knowing that inflation should be 2%. And as long as they know that, all these, uh, these decisions all together give you about inflation 2%. It actually works very well through a lot, uh, a lot of parts. Now, right now, that aspect has not been working. Inflation has been picking up, and we have to, you know, there's a lot of questions that are being asked about how, what to do about it. We, the Bank of Canada, are raising rates to slow the economy down, to kind of bring more that, uh, that demand, that, that was that robust recovery back in line with the capacity of the economy, but also it partly is to kind of address inflation expectations. So one of the big parts in when we think about how, how inflation runs, it's also, it runs partly in our head. It depends what we expect inflation to be. 
Because if you're a business and you're deciding like what price should you set, you're setting prices now, and you don't tend to change prices all the time. You're setting prices depending on how you think everyone else is going to set prices, and that's your expectation of inflation. The same thing if you're trying to figure out uh, different parts in uh, decision for wages, you're kind of trying to figure out where do I think inflation is going to be. All those elements kind of play together. And so inflation expectations become a very central part. If everyone starts believing inflation is going to go on at 7% without stop for many years, then it becomes self-fulfilling. Okay? And it, that will play by itself. Everyone will kind of act. And prices will go up by 7%, and people want to have wages that go up by 7%, and then inputs will kind of come up at 7%, and then it's natural that those prices go up, and it just kind of feeds in on, on one or the other. And so that's the aspect that have to break. But how that kind of breaking that depends very much on how you think inflation expectations are formed and how people kind of think about that. So what I want to do, before we look at theories of inflation expectations, and I discuss a bit about that. just want to tell you a little bit what inflation expectations have been doing in Canada. So first of all, in Canada, at the bank in particular, we, we look at a whole set of measures to try to get uh, measures of inflation expectations. So we do surveys. So when you kind of say, where do you get this information? One big part is surveys, and we do surveys both at the household levels and at the firm levels. And at the firm levels, we actually have two different sources here, and I'll kind of discuss that in a moment. But both kind of we're doing kind of the same type of thing through this, this part. So here on the left hand side I have expectations that are coming from our household surveys. On the right hand side I have expectations that are coming from those business surveys. We also use expectations that come from financial markets. We use expectations that are coming from other people's surveys. But we do our own surveys too to try to figure out how, what people are thinking about the, the future. And again if you see here there's different lines and kind of uh, let me look at that left-hand panel. That red line is expectations for inflation the next coming year. So it, we ask people, what do you think inflation is going to be the, next, the upcoming year? And if you look, the, the blue line is two years ahead, and the green line is five years ahead. And what you see is, prior to the pandemic, all these things were quite stable and kind of like thinking, okay, inflation is going to be more in that kind of 2 to 3% and kind of running over there. And what you see is really towards the end, this increase in these inflation expectations. The good thing is it's not kind of across all these. So the, the main part is we're still getting these high inflation expectations one year ahead. Two years are a bit less, by five years they're coming back. So there's kind of a, an aspect there that people think there's going to be inflation for a while, but also an aspect that it might, it might be coming back. But that's what, what worries us, is that type of process of thinking is that by itself going to create? And that's the, what we call the de-anchoring of inflation expectations. What we want people to get back is the belief inflation will get back to 2% and how that works. On the uh, right-hand panel, I have uh, some of these expectations. Those little lines at the end, so why do I have the long lines and the little lines, is because we have a new survey more recently. So the little lines are these uh, business pulse surveys that allow us at much quicker frequency to get what's happening. And so we can kind of see where those, uh, those inflation expectations are. And it's, again, that the green line is that kind of one year, the yellow two, uh, two years, and then that uh, purple is at that five years. So it looks a bit like in the household type aspect of getting those, those parts. So we have those inflation expectations that are out there. And that's the part that you get worried of whether this inflation, which was large part brought in, which I kind of discussed in the early part of this kind of the international pressures that brought in a lot of, of, of increases in the imported goods, in, in oil, in different aspects like that, that affect the cost of production, that affect some of the goods we buy. But slowly it has been expanding to more and more sectors and more and more things. And now that people are starting to expect it to be there, we get worried about how, how it continues. So what are different ways that we can type of think of, of expectations? I'm just going to go through a little bit of theory here and kind of pushing at two different extremes of thinking how we can think about uh, inflation expectations. And then I'm going to bring back that I think the reality is somewhere in between these two. But I want to emphasize how much it makes a big difference, and that will kind of come to discuss what is the role of communication and how the Bank of Canada has a role in communication to try to uh, make uh, this period uh, get back to lower inflation with the least possible disruption on the real side of the economy, just bringing it back that demand in, in line with supply. Okay. So the two theories I want to talk to you about is at one extreme, this aspect of adaptive expectations, 
And another part is kind of much more forward that's sometimes called rational expectations. So I want to contrast these two parts. And it's very different of how you'd address monetary policy and you see the challenge that we go forward between these two cases. Okay? What we think of adaptive expectations is very much that people don't listen to the Bank of Canada. They just look at inflation. And if I've seen it high recently, I just believe it's going to be high and continuing. So I don't make a very big case. I just take what's happened. I believe what happens. I don't kind of worry. And unless you show me, I don't change my beliefs. And so that's the adaptive expectations. And that's one way of kind of forming expectation. Now, that creates a big challenge for us because it means that if we want to bring those, uh, that inflation down, we have to do things that make those actual inflation even before the expectations change. Okay, so you have to kind of act, and that makes it that it's more likely you'll need a longer time of slowing down the economy to get those price pressures out and kind of uh, before you'll get uh, expectations, because expectations will just move after the fact. The flip side is this notion that, no, people could look a lot forward. They understand a lot about the economy. They can look forward or they understand or they listen to people that, uh, in the financial market that might understand and tell them, tell them what's happening. And then by looking forward and understanding uh, if the bank is credible and is interested in kind of reducing uh, inflation, we understand that, we can see that coming. And just by noticing that and understanding it, it kind of starts reducing uh, inflation by itself. And therefore, you need a lot less of this kind of slowdown in the economy to actually get inflation back to 2%. So that gives you two kind of extremes. Just to give you an idea of how those extremes work, this is uh, simulation from one of our models at the bank of comparing how the economy might work and come back to 2% inflation if we have rational expectations versus this, this adaptive expectation. So first thing to notice is to get back to that 2%, it takes, so first of all, so you think about the nominal interest rate is that's what we uh, can determine, that short run rate at the bank. We have control over that. And to get things back, the blue line is always the rational expectation part. The red line is this adaptive expectation part. So you see it takes less interest rates to actually get you back. You can do it at a smaller amount of raising the rates if people understand and start thinking this forward way. If you do it and people are more adaptive, it's going to take you a harder. What you see on the other ones is really what's important. You see by these different, these different ways of, of increasing the different nominal rates, you see how inflation moves very differently. Under the adaptive expectations, it takes a long time. Inflation goes down very slowly. Under uh, this rational expectations, it goes down quite quickly. In terms of kind of output production relative to where you would have been in the absence of all this, is again, you see basically, you're under the rational expectation, you almost get output not changing. This is what we often call a very nice soft landing. You get this reduction in inflation by not getting a big cost in output. The adaptive expectation, it really is costly in terms of output. Now what's happening here is, these are these expectations. You can't quite see it here, but what's happening here is in this, in this part of forward looking is you start getting the expectations to decline and that feeds into where, um, where the expectations are and that's kind of giving you that rapid kind of comeback. Now how do we want to think about that? Well, I don't think we're at either one of those. Okay. Rational expectations is way too, like people can't figure out all these things and think all this aspect through. It's just too far. At the same time, people aren't so mechanical that they just look at what happened and kind of just necessarily do what they kind of see what they, you know, whatever they just saw is necessarily what's going to happen. It's somewhere in between. And this is where communication is really important. And this is where the bank's kind of role in communicating monetary policy in the aspect of how we weigh very, that in a very important way in all our, all our aspect is as we can communicate and try to understand how people are, are seeing the difficulties in the economy, trying to explain what we're doing by explaining how we're going to get inflation back down, that we're committed to this, people can start thinking, okay, they seem committed, different parts, I'll start believing, and maybe we can get that process not to the rational expectations, but more in that direction. More we get that communication, more we get people to understand what we're trying to do through this. We're both trying to kind of bring back demand more in line with supply, kind of slowing down that economy, and getting people to understand through that process, you can start expecting that inflation will fall. And if we can get that and people understand it, we'll get things 
kind of getting to a softer landing as best as possible. So it really is a communication between us and the general public that has to run well to make this as best as possible. If it doesn't work well, it takes longer, it's harder to get there. If we can do it better, we'll actually as a, as a group kind of arrive to a better, a better type of outcome. So that's kind of the, the trade-offs there and that's how we think about the role of expectations being very central to the uh, monetary policy. And so as we're doing things like, like I say, we're right now we've been increasing rates, we've been increasing rates for five, five decisions in a row. We're trying to kind of bring back uh, this very overheated economy and control those expectations. So with that, all that said, let me just sum up. So this whole period, obviously, it's been, it's been a hard period. You know, we went through all these aspects with COVID and, you know, both on the health side, the social side, and the economic side. And as we're kind of going forward, we're continuously trying to learn both using past experience, noticing what's different with past experience so we can use them properly now. Sometimes we have to notice that this is a very different world, so we kind of keep on learning. We're trying to manage with our international partners to try to look and understand the coordination issues, the spillovers issues, so that even as a global world economy, a lot of these things are decided also at that level, that we're trying to kind of uh, get the best outcomes possible. We're also looking at a lot of the things I, I mentioned before. We're looking at people's balance sheets. How are that, how's that going? We're looking at the labor market. But the bottom line is we have a mandate at the Bank of Canada, and it is for 2% inflation. We're committed to get it there, and we'll do what we need to get it there. And we'll try to explain along the way as much as we can how we're doing it and why it should get us there. And I'll, I'll end there, and thank you very much. Stay. Can you on? No, it's not on. Can I have a microphone? Okay, um, so we have about 15 minutes for a question and answer. So if you have a question, um, put your hand up, and I think Sherry Ann um, will come around. Oh, okay. Um, we have microphones on both sides, so if you put your hand up, then they'll bring you a microphone. Um, so I see one there and, and one over, over there. Hey, there's some kind of all lot down this middle. Um, and then when you get the mic, I guess you can ask. And, and we don't have a lot of time, so um, ask short questions on it. First. I'll make it. My Hello mind. there. My name is Charlie. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, if you talk to students, people in Waterloo, I would say that a massive problem right now is the increase in rents over the last two and a half years. Um, it wouldn't be absurd, I think, to say that it's increased maybe 10 to 15 percent in the last two and a half years. Uh, what can we do on a macro level uh, to solve this problem and alleviate the troubles that people are having in this way? I, I, you're exactly right. And so that's exactly a very important component in this, uh, in this increase in inflation, what we've seen. So you're exactly right. We're very much aware of that. Now, a lot of that is not you know, directly uh, monetary policy. A lot of that is really housing policy and kind of needing to build and kind of get the amount of housing that's needed there. And there's different policies that are being addressed on that side. And so directly, you know, uh, you know it's not something that our policy will hit on directly, but we're hoping that by doing what we're doing, we'll stop seeing these increases and at least kind of get this to kind of more balance out and kind of get that aspect that we'll stop seeing it uh, get worse. Hopefully then we'll have more supply coming on from different things. Now just to kind of remind people a little bit in this housing market during this part, one of the things that was, even if we can't see it so much, that was quite, quite successful through this whole COVID period is we kept on building things, okay? So it's actually in some sense it's still a, a bit of a puzzle why things are kind of so much in tight supply. Like they were tight before COVID but they're much worse now. But it's not that because we stopped building things during COVID. Part of the aspect of this stimulus that we had in really kept that construction industry going and we actually built a lot of things during that period. But still, that hasn't been enough and really need more of that, that supply part. Hello, my name is Jim. Um, just, could you explain to me in very simple layman's terms what quantitative easing is at the bank? Yeah. Okay. Because I, everything I read, I just get confused and I just don't understand it. And, you know, the government uses the bank's quantitative easing to borrow money. And then where does that all go? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're exactly right. So, so first of all, there's kind of this misperception that 
quantitative easing is about this uh, production of cash. Okay? That's not how, how it works. So what we have at the bank, we can put out, uh, you know, we can buy things and like anyone else, you can kind of buy and borrow at the same time. Okay? And we, put, we kind of put out liabilities which are called, it's a bit tricky, so it's, I know you want to kind of have it very simple, I'll try to make it, but it is a tricky aspect. I'll then explain what is the goal here. So we put out these, uh, these settlement balances. Right now these settlement balances pay three and a quarter percent. So they're not like cash, they're actually like an asset, they pay three and a quarter. So what we were doing, and that's, that was the idea, now we're in kind of what's quantitative tightening, so we're going in the other direction. Now we're undoing what we had done because we want to kind of slow down the economy. But during COVID, what we wanted to do is we, we control that short-term interest rate, but we wanted some of these longer-term interest rates to come down because that's actually where businesses and households actually borrow, more at three years and five years. So you want to bring that down. So what you want to do is kind of buy assets that are that duration and give shorter ones, okay? So making these longer ones a bit more rare by putting in shorter ones. And that's what we were doing. We were switching these long-term assets for short-term assets, okay? That makes the, the long-term assets rare and actually starts putting down pressure on those long-term interest rates. Now we're doing the opposite. We're undoing that. We're kind of taking off what we had so the more long-term assets are going back into the economy and less of these short-term. So that's really what we do when we kind of do that. We go on the secondary market and we buy long-term assets and switch them into short-term assets. That's, that's what quantitative easing is about, quantitative tightening. But the way you should think is really think about the policy in general is all about interest rates. It's both about the short-term and the long-term. So what we were trying to do through this part uh, prior was trying to create that recovery both by having those short and long-term interest rates kind of stay low in helping the recovery come in. And this is one part where we can kind of get both that short and long-term rates working. And that was the part that kind of helped us. Now we're undoing that, we're kind of thinking, no, it's okay, we want those short and long-term rates to go up, so we undo that part. I know it's a little bit tricky, I'd like to kind of give a little bit more, but that's, uh, I'm hoping that's as simple as I could give there. need to worry too much, but I've got, got a couple questions. First of all, whether they're real or not, there's a perception of uh, windfall profits out there, probably especially the oil companies, that I think lead to a lot of inflation. Uh, but there is also the, a lot of collective agreements uh, don't match inflation. So you've now got a significant number of collective agreements that are going to be coming up where people have lost a significant buying power. So I think you've got two factors out there that are going to drive inflation uh, in the future. And I'm just looking for some comments. You're exactly kind of just remembering. So the first factors that were really running this aspect is exactly this part that a lot of it was this imported inflation, which is kind of like on oil prices, on different things, you know, there's also now we've had grain as the parts that are kind of coming on from Ukraine. So we had all those parts. Slowly, that's like the first round effect. Then that kind of runs through the system. That affects inputs for a lot of other firms. Then you start getting a second round effect as those kind of prices. And then eventually we get the, the wages. Obviously, it makes sense. People want to have that kind of adjustment. And you kind of get that process. But what you want to kind of stop is that that process just doesn't kind of feed on itself. And so a large part of what we try to do is by slowing down the economy a bit, kind of getting it less to overheat as at the moment, is kind of getting that more in line where all that can kind of readjust. As we see, and we'll be looking at uh, many aspects, as we see some of the international pressures diminish, some of the domestic pressures diminish, and some of that process kind of slowly kind of wear, working its way through. And it's certainly a difficult period. There's things that are really changed in price. I mean, you know, we were at a point where uh, gas was really cheap. Now it's expensive. That's something that, you know, can't just compensate just off the top. There's a lot of things that have become harder. As some of these aspects kind of wear themselves off, not so much the oil might stay there for a while, but a lot of the kind of other supply bottlenecks and different things, we see that kind of reducing and we want that process to work its way through. But it's certainly difficult on people and we recognize that. Hi. <coughs> Hi, so now there's like uh, around the world central banks are like tightening altogether and is there like um, a consideration that during the pandemic 
uh, it seems like most central banks over like ease the economy and now the economy is like overheated. Is there a consideration where it might be over tightening the economy and might cause a recession or is it too early to call that? Thank you. Certainly too early to call. But again, what I kind of tried to give you by what I was talking about, remember there's both those activity channels and that inflation channel. And as everyone's tightening, there's kind of those two channels and figuring out which of those two channels are going to dominate. Now, one of the things we'd like is if there's a bit of that tightening in the world, if it's doing kind of coming through some of that inflation channel, so kind of cutting out some of the demand in the goods and making those bottlenecks less, that'll work and help us through, as an aggregate, help us in kind of getting that inflation down. The flip side, if it's the activity channel that starts dominating, then it means it's a harder kind of landing of the overall. Figuring out which one is kind of dominating is exactly the type of questions you kind of have to look at here and you're trying to balance that and that's certainly you know that aspect but it is noticing that kind of subtle part that, that there's really those two those two dimensions and you want to understand both of them and they're at play right now figuring out which one is dominating is is a good question but you can see why it's not so obvious either way hi uh, two quick questions uh, US Treasury they have something called I series bonds but we don't have that in Canada um, any idea um, is there any reason for why that is? These are the which bonds? Uh, I series bonds, so they're inflation hedged bonds. Where no, we they have just, we have inflation we hedged bonds. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Was, so usually you kind of yeah call them the tip bonds in the in the bonds. U.S. But yeah, we have also inflation index bonds also in Canada. So you can buy some if you want some. Okay. So it's uh, it's fine. So if that's what you want. Now notice you know inflation index bonds will give you very low rates, and so that's, that's fine, but that's, uh, that's how they work. They're kind of indexed to inflation, and you can have those, and it's, uh, we have a market for that in Canada, and it exists, so we have the same thing, yeah. Oh, thank you. And uh, other question, uh, the way we measure inflation, is there anything you change about it? Is there anything you think deserves more weight, isn't included in the index that ought to be? So again, one of the things that's been done a lot through, actually through this, uh, through this pandemic in particular, was to try to look at a lot of different measures during that part, because one of the things, even the, uh, the baskets of goods that we kind of you know, consume during the, uh, the period, like, uh, you know, does it make sense? Like, suppose if you're in COVID and you think you know, one weight in the kind of uh, CPI basket was air transportation. Well, we couldn't fly, okay? So maybe you wouldn't want to include that in different things. And so, but what was surprising, as much as you know, StatsCan did a whole bunch of exercises of taking pieces out and everything, it surprisingly didn't matter so much. The same thing, often we think, okay, people across, and I'm not saying I don't want to minimize that there is these kind of differences, but you know, people across different socioeconomic groups might have a quite different basket. Is the inflation rate very different across if we change and kind of weigh those? Surprisingly, it's not too different. And so it's actually a measure that kind of captures a lot of what, what we want and kind of reflecting, again, to the extent that you can have a measure that's an average measure that tries to capture for the average person what's happening, I think it's a pretty good measure. But that doesn't stop. The main things that are really kind of the harder parts are always the new goods. The harder part in kind of index is kind of figure out how do you price things compared to the past when they didn't exist. And that's really the kind of forefront of the challenge in terms of these uh, pricing index. And, it, and those things matter because, you know, there's been a lot of things that, you know, so think about your, uh, your phones, okay? Well, how do we compare, you know, a phone now to a phone 20 years ago, we've had all this improvement. Is it worth, like, in some sense, a phone that we have now would have cost, like, you know, $200,000, or they could, you couldn't even have one. But anyways, it's kind of like a, so how do you kind of treat that? It would have been super expensive. Now we all have them. And that treatment is really one of the, the, the challenges, is how to bring in uh, some of those um, new goods. But that's more kind of a longer term type of thing. It doesn't change so rapidly, but that's probably the, the hardest thing is the treatment of quality of goods and quality of new goods. Um, so we just have time for a couple more questions. One, two, three, and then four. Okay, and that's sort of all the hands over. Um, so go ahead. Okay, hi, um, I'm Emily, and I'm the fourth year student in economics, and I have a question, and I know that you are the boss of like microeconomics, and here's the situation that uh, during the pandemic, they have a lot of agents that reach out to the international students and their um, parents that to buy our condo and buy our apartment. And my question is that, is that a really su suitable time for us to have the international investment, like to buy 
these apartments and whether are they are the agents? Is that really considerate or just to make money? And this is the question. Thank you. Okay. Now, I won't be telling people how to invest their money. That's not my role. I won't kind of go around and tell you, you know, whether or not you should be buying. What I, I want to tell you is kind of like what we're doing, what we see in terms of the, the general trends in the economy, and then people have to go out and do their, their own invest, investment decisions. So I like to answer more, but I kind of like, you know, the idea of kind of getting into the, the aspect of where people put their money. We kind of try to give the information out, give the aspect of where the macro economy is going, such that people can take those better decisions. Those better decisions are usually done better in an environment where inflation is low and stable, and that's really our goal. Create that environment so people don't have to think about inflation when they're taking those decisions, thinking about the real things of whether this is a good investment for them. Hi, Paul. Uh, how concerned are you with uh, the average Canadian's ability to pay, or I guess refinance, their mortgage in the short to medium term. In the area where I live, and call it a row of 15 to 20 houses, within the last, I would say, 30 to 60 days, four to five of them have, got, have gone up for sale. Uh, so when I look at the interest rate increases, and I look at the inflation combined with Canadians' needs to refinance, are you a little bit afraid at least that that will have some sort of ancillary effect on the economy as people sort of have a hard time trying to refinance their mortgages? So there's a few things uh, in that question. Um, first of all, there, there is a part that, you know, um, trying to figure out that the, the refinancing kind of, you know, comes through time because most people, this is kind of over time. So it's not something that we're looking at very closely of trying to figure out how much it slows down the economy exactly as people kind of come to the end of their mortgage and how much it would be higher relative to when they, they took it before. You have to remember that people that are kind of renewing now, if they're five years before, the rates weren't that different now than they were before. So a lot of them are renewing. The ones that are kind of being more of the problem are the ones that actually took in kind of more in, let's say, uh, at the beginning of 2021 or something, which was really low. And that'll turn out in, in, in 26 that we'll start seeing that. So we kind of calculate that and kind of getting those parts. So we kind of follow that. That's an important piece. Now, part of our strategy is exactly that we're trying to bring people to kind of reduce some of their spending because really we have this overheated market. And so that's one part that is a reflection of that, that some people will be kind of uh, more, more constrained there. But like I say, in terms of figuring out whether they should be able to pay and be able to refinance, have to say that, you know, and that's one of the, the aspects of the rules that have been put in in our safeguards in our financial system was trying to say people should be able to to pay more than the rates. And when they kind of came in, you were kind of checking rates and saying uh, people have to pay at least you know, 2%, be able to pay 2% more than what was there. And that kind of gives us a buffer. And so in that sense, there's a lot of people that might find it tight but should be able to pay. And part of that tightness is going to kind of reduce some of the spending and kind of help bring this kind of demand back in line with supply in the economy. Hello. Uh, hi, I want to do uh, ask a question about central bank digital currency because I know that Bank of Canada is really far advanced in this field and more advanced than the U.S. So I saw a feature called programmable money, which is money that could be expired for if we put this feature on a stimulus check and expire within 30 days. Do you think this is a good feature for reducing policy likes? It's not at all one of the things we're considering. If we put out a CBDC, it would not have that type of feature. It would not be that kind of part. We'd want to put out a money that people would feel like. One of the reasons would be that you know, we have the disappearance of cash and giving people an alternative, not something that looks completely different, but actually something that is digital and that they could use as an alternative to cash and having that same security and knowing that it's there and having that stability in it. So that's what if we were to put out a CBDC, and first of all, that's also a decision by uh, the government if we do put it. We've been analyzing different parts and looking at different possibilities, but certainly that uh, we want to put out, if we put out a CBDC, we want something that it looks secure and resembles a lot like cash and has that kind of feeling that it has its value and it's backed by the, uh, the Bank of Canada. Hi. Okay, so you mentioned that uh, inflation rates are right now at 7% and that um, 
the Bank of Canada wants to get it to 2%. So what are the goals that you have to like get it to 2% and how long will it take to be able to get to 2%? And why would you want to stay at 2%? Okay. So, so first of all, uh, I'll, I'll kind of start with the end question, is the 2% was kind of thought back a long time ago and it's been kind of uh, rather uh, successful in the sense of thinking 2% is a little bit in between where you're very close to kind of, it's not far from zero, so you kind of think, okay, things don't move, but it gets a bit of flexibility in the system at 2%. Generally at 2%, people don't seem to kind of complain about inflation and the system works pretty well. And over time, we look at different countries and that seems to kind of be a system that works well and worked well for Canada for a long time. So when we had the renewal of our mandate, that was put back in our renewal. The idea is to stay at that, at that 2%. Now in the idea of how we're going to get there and how long, Again, it depends a lot on these mechanisms. Our best guess is it's going to be coming down. It takes to really get down to that 2%. We think it takes about two years to kind of go through this whole part. But a lot of that starts dropping now. And a lot of it is kind of the slow is getting from 3% back down to 2 and kind of go slowly. So think about a line that's going slowly like that and that takes, takes quite a while. How we're doing that is exactly by this process of of right now increasing rates a lot to signal this kind of very much our commitment to bring it back down to try to do two things of bringing uh, the activity more in line with the capacity of this economy, not, not to be overheating, and to kind of have people understand our commitment to it so they start thinking this will come down and just by thinking that will help that whole process get down. So that's what we're doing. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Margaret Inslee up to uh, offer some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you.